You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show. Rated the number one podcast of all time. Of all time. Make sure you're ready because this is the podcast where you are guaranteed to learn virtually everything. The Brian Callen Show is brought to you by Audible. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash BCS for The Brian Callen Show and get a free download. Uh, Audible is a company I've been using for many, many years. I have a number of their books actually on my phone right now. And I think that, you know, everybody always talks about how they don't have time to read and things. And what's great about Audible is you can you can get, uh, they have 150,000 titles to choose from. So you can get pretty much any book there is. And when you're in traffic, when you're working out, you can get a book read. There's no excuse not to be well read. And that's what I th- That's why I think Audible is a fantastic company. They use great actors, and I actually think, in, in a lot of ways, it's better to listen to a book than to read it, um, uh, for for a whole host of reasons. I think you 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 absorb more. And by the way, they have over a thousand science and, and technology uh, titles, which is pretty amazing, and and science fiction, and fantasy. I mean, so you can pretty much get. It's very rare that I actually type in a book and I don't see it on Audible. The, everything I ever want to read is always there. So um, I think it's an outstanding company, uh, and I'm proud, uh, I'm proud to, to shell for them because I think uh, they do a lot of good. So go to audiblepodcast.com slash BCS for The Brian Callen Show and get a free download. All right, everybody, you're listening to The uh, Brian Callen Show with my partner in crime, Hunter Mott. And... Um, I'm just going to very quickly, uh, guys, I will be um, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, the 11th, no, I'm sorry, the 12th, 13th, and 14th at Good Nights doing stand-up and uh, making people laugh, hopefully. And then uh, in October, October 3rd and 4th, I'll be at Donnie B's in Springfield, Illinois. Got no idea. No idea. Never been there. And then uh, I'm sure I have a huge listenership in, ship in Sp- Springfield, Illinois. And in Shelbyville. Damn right. And then October 11th, 12th, and 13th, I'm at the Houston Improv. That's going to be a blast. Um, <clears throat> without further ado, my guest, Josh Foer, um, who's got a, an, a crazy, a great website, by the way. I, I read a bunch of the stuff on your website. But he wrote a book called Moonwalking with Einstein, The Art and Science of Remembering. Uh, Josh, welcome to the the esteemed. <laughs> Brian Callen <laughs> slash Hunter I'm, Macho. I'm honored to be here. Thank that's you. what I. That's the kind of atti- that's the kind of attitude I'm looking for out of you, young man. As he as he calls from New Haven, Connecticut, home of Yale University, dun, married dun, dun. to somebody who does quote unquote something at, at Yale. Yale. <laughs> I love it. Probably, yeah. probably the dean probably pulls out a, a ruler when you've been naughty. <laughs> um, my friend, uh, take us through this. I, I've already been doing the memory um, the memory tricks if you will, yeah. from the mem- okay. memory palace. But I use my own body to do it. And I'm telling you, man, it's amazing. And one of the things that I found fascinating was um, th- how how good our memories already are. And let, let's just talk for a second before we go into it. Tell us about your odyssey. You basically took this challenge to be the memory champion of the United States. I mean... Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't totally know that I was taking on a challenge right when I started this. Um, I mean, my basic story is I'm a, I'm a science journalist. And so I go around and I try and find interesting weird stories <clears throat> that hopefully, you know, tell us something about ourselves or about how how um, the universe works, I guess. And yeah. I had gone to this memory contest called the it's called the United States Memory Championship and it's held every year in New York. And I'd gone to cover it just thinking that it sounded kinda weird. And um, ended up getting I guess sort of stuck down a rabbit hole uh, of, of, of of weirdness in fact. And yeah, I mean, some of the characters in the book are fascinating, man. Like, well, so, you I, know, yeah, you, you would think the people who would compete in a, in a memory contest they must be some kind of freak of nature, um, savant, you know, Dustin Hoffman, Rain Man kind of character. Yeah, I mean, give us an example of like the kind of things that people were able to memor- memorize because it blew my mind. It's it's mind blowing. They, they memorize hundreds of random numbers after looking at them just once. <laughs> uh, they memorize entire poems. Uh, there's one event where they uh, they have five strangers just like, get up on stage and reel off every imaginable biographical detail they can come up with. Like, Here's the name of my pet. Here's my phone number. This is where I grew up. This is what kind of car I drive. I like to eat pizza, spaghetti, and clams, and whatever, whatever, whatever. And these guys were remembering all of it. And it turns out they are not 
freaks of nature, or at least not uh, in the way that you know you might expect. Mm-hmm. That these are all people with relatively average natural memories, but they've all trained themselves using a set of ancient techniques to um, to hold these, you know, to, to perform these incredible feats of memory. And I was like, that's amazing. I want to I want to learn how to do that. And that's that's what the book is about. It's about how I learned how to train my memory. Well, the thing I got from the book also is the fact that <clears throat> I think an 11 page Latin manuscript, um, I think loosely you call it the memory palace. And it goes back to this, this ancient myth of, of, uh, I think a poet who, who went out to the bathroom and he was in this palace or this sort of, you know, area where people were eating and the whole thing collapsed. And he kind of, uh, went through associating, he kind of reconstructed everything in his mind and, and, and basically the arts of memory trick, the, um, learning how to have a good memory have not changed since 82 BC or something. Yeah. So this is what, like, what actually drew me to this subject is that, um, once upon a time, people used to have great memories. They used to train their memories because they had to. Yeah, because, because they were, they there wasn't writing, there wasn't the printing. The yeah, the printing press wasn't invented, etc. Right, mm. and so in a world where um, you know you didn't have like books that you could pull off the shelf, and you didn't have a notebook that you could you could write stuff down in your pocket, uh, much less an iPhone. Having a great memory was crucial. It was everything, mm. and so people really invested in training their memories and in learning a set of techniques for doing that. And so it's, it's like one set of techniques, it's one set of tricks that go back. Um, 2,500 years. Uh, I mean, they are 2,500 years old, barely changed at all. And today, most people don't know about them because we just don't need to have great memories in the way that people once did. Um, but one of the things that I did was I went back and I read some of those original writings about how to train your memory that are... Yeah, you know, and it goes even even Thomas old. Aquinas and Cicero and all, all these sort of great thinkers... Um, oh yeah, all through the Middle Ages, everybody was doing this. Every mm-hmm. people used to learn not just like the things that they had to remember in school, but they also learned techniques for remembering them. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, this episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. And for a free trial and ten percent off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code. Callan 8. Uh, this is a good company, and I, I first heard about it through Joe Rogan, um, and it's actually incredibly easy to use. And if there are any listeners out there that use Squarespace, will you send me an example of what you've done on it so I can talk about it on the air? Because I think it's actually a really good company, and I think it's an example of what technology is doing for all of us. It's making it cheaper for all of us to you know, run a business or just create a presence on the web. Um, and I love that. And I, so I think it's a, it's actually an excellent company. Uh, and they're always updating uh, their platform. And it, it starts at 8 bucks a, mo- a month and includes a free domain name and if you sign up for a year. So, and every design automatically includes a unique mobile experience that matches the overall style of your website. So your content will look great on any device every time. Um, and uh, it's pretty fantastic. So just remember to go to squarespace.com and use the offer code Callan8. One of the things, the other thing I came away from the book is I realized it's actually possible in, in, in to actually memorize, for example, all the works of Shakespeare. I mean, it's, it's, it's physically or mentally, I suppose, possible if you know how to apply these techniques. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm, a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah. But yeah, well, you know, uh, look, our, our brains are humongous, um, humongous organs, and they can hold uh, a ton of information. And actually, if they, you know, just as you're going about your daily life, you're remembering lots and lots of, of things that you don't even, they don't even register as pieces of memory, mm. the things that you're remembering. I mean, if you, if you were to, like, come visit my apartment in New Haven, Connecticut, and just walk around for a few minutes, it sure, take a long time because you make a fortune as a science writer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in one yeah, wing, in one wing of the apartment. In New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In your memory um, palace. In the golden yeah. wing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if, if you were to come visit the golden wing of my palace in New Haven, Connecticut, <laughs> and walk around for a minute, minute and a half, you'd walk out of my apartment. You would have a perfect map of where everything was. Right? Right. You would remember... Um, where there's, uh, you know, my soap is, my refrigerator, where there's a giant stuffed turkey on the wall that 
uh, a brother who became an ardent vegetarian gave me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he wrote Eating Animals or something, right? I haven't read yeah, that Yeah, and then it suddenly became, it was unbecoming for him to have a stuffed turkey in his house. So, yeah, so jo- it, jo- it, it, uh, Josh's, Josh's brother is Jonathan Safran Foer, who, who wrote uh, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, which is one of the best books, period, uh, you know, anyway. And, and then another book called Eating Animals, I think. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. Okay, um, so. But the point is, like, you can walk around somebody's house for just a minute, and you, you walk out with an incredible blueprint of where everything was, right? Mm-hmm. And right. Uh, we don't register that as a feat of memory, but that is a, uh, a ton of information that you are walking out the door with. Sure. And so one of the, the memory techniques that goes back to antiquity, this memory technique called the memory palace, the idea behind it is, like, what if instead of walking through my apartment and remembering where the soap or the, the refrigerator and the stuffed turkey were, what if you saw images in your mind's eye of things that you actually cared to remember, like, um, you know, the words of a poem or um, items on a shopping list? Or if you're competing in one of these memory contests, maybe it's like, you know, 100 random numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's that's... That's the technique. It's taking the fact that you have a really great visual and spatial memory Mm -hmm. and using that visual and spatial memory to store other kinds of information. Because you you talk about how, in the book, how our minds work with space and imagery, right? Yeah, I mean, it's what we're good at. It's what we evolved to be good at. My my buddy, uh, um, Hunter, who's just, you know, you got your degree at Harvard from biochemistry? Biochemistry, yeah. Yeah, but Hunter also speaks uh, really and well at least eight languages at any given time. And and uh, how much? Uh, and he wrote a book called The Straight A Conspiracy, which is basically for high school kids, but anybody about how how we learn the wrong way and how learning really has to do with the emotional context in which you you approach whatever it is to learn. But let me ask uh, Hunter, how much do you use? Because Hunter's the one who, ta- who turned me on to your book and and to you, what you were doing, Josh. Um, wh- do you use those kind of techniques when you study language? Uh, well, I mean, the thing is, because it's I'm, I'm piggyback. My piggyback question to this, uh, Josh, is in the world of you know Google and stuff like that. How how much how important is learn uh, memorizing? But, but go on. Well, I mean, you know what Josh is talking about is essentially you know we look at computers right, and we see that they're really good at remembering random information, and we find remembering remembering random information very difficult, right? But we're amazing at, you know, that visual spatial memory, right? Mm. We're really good at remembering the locations of things. And that's because in an evolutionary context, you know, it was very useful to remember where were the fruit trees, right? Yeah. In the jungle, because that's a source of food. That's a source of nutrition. Right. And the point is to then take what we do well and use it to remember um, things that we don't do so well, like random data, which we didn't evolve to remember. The thing is, is that with languages, you know, we did evolve. I mean, our our, our capacity for words and language is already so strong mm. that you don't necessarily have to remember, rely on those random techniques. You know what I mean? It's We have such great contextual memory. I mean, you know, in the book you talk about, you know, the guy who remembered the, memorized the Chinese Oxford English dictionary yeah, that's or some crazy, crazy thing, that, that's, right? That, that's crazy, Josh. Yeah, I think we can all agree that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> but, it, but he's... he's And a, the fact that Hunter went to Harvard, not to intimidate <laughs> you, Josh. <laughs> I know you're at Yale, the poor man's Harvard, but anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, but, I mean, you know, like, the, it seems like, uh, you know, they're remembering that information as a series of random data rather than remembering the words by understanding the meaning, understanding, for example, you know, Chinese characters are are incredibly meaningful, right? There's all sorts of radicals. Each little part means something. And so you can remember it in terms of random information. Do you speak Chinese? Uh, Some. But uh, but you can you can if you really sort of dig into the deep structure of those characters, you can remember it in a meaningful way rather than just remembering it locationally. Right. Yeah. So I mean, these techniques were are like useful in a rather narrow context. They're really useful when information, when it's hard to integrate information into that kind of like natural context, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're trying to remember a list of random words, uh, that's like, you know, there's no, they don't have inherent meaning. Mm-hmm. And um, that's where something like this comes in handy. Or if you're trying to memorize a speech, right, where, um, uh, and that's actually what these techniques were originally invented for, was for um, people who were giving speeches mm-hmm. to right. memorize them. 
and they're really useful techniques in when there is structured information mm -hmm. and where like there's just n no way of making it immediately sort of meaningful um, giving it a natural context that would make it actually memorable and also if you're trying to do something vast i mean i think one of the one of the most impressive things you talked about was the shas polak um maybe oh, yeah. you could, maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit about that these are guys who memorize the entire Babylonian Talmud, which is like uh, thousands, many thousands of pages, and, and memorize the Babylonian it. Talmud. I mean, talk about exciting reading! <laughs> you, learn, you learn how you learn how to quarter a calf, and how 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 eating osprey is a bad idea. Yeah, Woo well, guys, uh, the Talmud. Uh, it has its exciting parts, and uh, <laughs> um, but these guys know it so well that they can stick a pin through any 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 chapter of the Talmud, basically, and tell you what word it passes through on every page. So crazy. They used, to think that, they used to think that was a legend, but it's actually true. Oh, yeah. No, no. I mean, it was, it was, this, was, this has been uh, documented in in, um, in a scientific journal. I don't know if there's anybody who can do that today, but this is the turn of the 20th century. There were definitely people who could do it. Um, but I will say, about, about language, mm. so I actually had, I had the same sort of um, sense that you did originally, that, well, this these memory techniques really wouldn't be that useful for learning a language. Mm. But then I was in a situation where I actually had to learn a new language. And this is for, for my next book that I'm working on, I've been, um, I've been spending a lot of time in Central Africa living with uh, hunter-gatherers, living with pygmies. Wow. And I needed to learn a language. I needed to learn the national language of the Congo in order to, to speak with these guys. And you just got back from the Congo, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, I mean, I've, I've now made... Uh, and I made four trips, and I, so I just got back from a month over there. Unbelievable, I, man! I'm, I wish you had seen Joseph Kony, so you could have shot him in the head. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I think about when I think of the Congo. I'm like, ah, oh, that the biggest asshole in the world lives there. Uh, well, the second biggest asshole after me, but uh, <laughs> when I'm there. But, uh, so, you know, I needed to learn this language, and. Uh, I didn't know what to do because like, it's an obscure African language that I couldn't find anybody to teach me. Um, and what I did was I memorized the dictionary, which would have seemed like an impossible thing to do mm -hmm. before I knew how to use these memory devices. Right. And in the end, it was actually not that hard. So there were, there are only 1,100 words in this language. Mm. And I used a piece of web soft, uh, a web app that was invented actually by the, the main character in my book, um, which forces you to come up with an image of every word that you want to you want to remember hmm. and wow. visualize uh, that word. So, like, for example, the word for heart in Lingala, this mm. language, is motema. So what I did was I picture in my mind's eye, do you remember old computer modems that, like, beep, 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 you yep. know, they made all those funny sounds? Yep. So I picture just, like, a beating heart, uh, just dripping blood all over a computer modem. Mm -hmm. Right, and yeah. I had that image in my mind's eye, so that when I was trying to remember what's the word for heart, that image pops into my mind. Heart modem. Oh, right, motema. A motema. Uh, wow. And that's what I did to learn these eleven 1 hundred words. And that's not the same thing as learning a language. I mean, you can knowing eleven 1 hundred words does not make you a speaker of a language. But well, well, that's that's something. Detail. Yeah, that's something that you touch on too about. You have a chapter said the end of remembering. And also, you know, when Ed, I think is the guy who had rheumatoid arthritis, said, I'm going to teach you a trick. And first you're going to think, well, these mental athletes is just a stupid trick. It is in the beginning, but then you go beyond. So there's a difference between memorizing and learning. Explain right. that. Explain that. Well, I mean, the language is a good example of that, yeah. right? So, like, I didn't actually learn the language when I memorized 1,100 words. But it was an incredible structure for me to then, you know, get off the plane in Brazzaville and be able to start really learning the language. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, likewise, you know, so I studied biology when I was in school, and the stuff you just have to know yeah. to be to, to do biology, right? So if you're doing evolutionary biology, you just have to know when all of the the, the geological periods were, you know, the Jurassic, Triassic, Cretaceous, etc. Well, you could have just I, read the Bible, dude, because you know, whatever, whatever, whatever with your evolutionary biology. And it, yeah. I didn't know we were talking to a pagan, but keep going. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when I was learning all that evolutionary mumbo-jumbo, um, <laughs> you know, you, ha you have to know when those different periods were, because if you don't know, then nothing else makes sense. 
Right. The only way to know it is to memorize it. There's just no way around that. So you know you have to you have to have that basis of knowledge if you're gonna be able to really learn and integrate other information around it. And that's mm. that's a, I mean an unfortunate fact of, of the school is there. There's no way around it. There's stuff you have to memorize. And the the, um, int- the interesting thing is to go back to Brian's point is you know one of the things you really chart in the book so well is. That, you know, with the invention of writing, you know, memorizing large amounts of information became less necessary. With the printing press, that was even more true. And now with computers and the Internet and all that sort of stuff, we allow ourselves to believe that we don't need to memorize things, that we can just look everything up at at the drop of a hat. But, you know, throughout throughout history, there has been this understanding that, you know, massive amounts of repetition of certain basic information is necessary in order to free up the mind to be able to innovate and create. Right. You know, Mm -hmm. you don't become a great musician unless you practice the shit out of your chords. And the same thing. I was fascinated, Josh, in your book about the chess masters and how what makes them so great. Because I had read Josh Waitzkin's book. I don't know if you ever read it, like The Art of Learning. It's a very good book, but you know one of the things that we kind of took the mystique out of these great chess masters. Well, they seem really intelligent. Well, cognitively, not necessarily. What they're really good at is memorizing old games that they yeah. then, they can then apply. So what they can do is chunk massive amounts of information. They can see so much more than you can see because they they're they're five steps ahead of you in that sense. Not thinking six te- seven moves ahead, which I could never fathom. They just have seen this before. This this it's, pa- it's pattern recognition. That's right. what it is. Right. And but that's what all intelligence is in a way. Yeah. It's like I see something in the world around me that somehow on some level registers with some experience that I've had before that is similar in some way and therefore I know what to do in this situation because I have I have the, the ability to recognize the past in the present. Bo- and, boxing, and, and, boxing, uh, 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 jujitsu, any of that stuff, even even real time, you know, split second sports, you know, where the, your margin for error is very small. It's exactly that. It's all pattern recognition. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's that's what you're learning when you're studying any new skill. Yeah, and that's and in terms of you know what happens in education, one of the interesting things is there's this this bizarre tension that's being created between you know Eastern learning styles and Western learning styles, where you know the West looks at the East and is like, oh, it's just rote repetition, you know, there's no creativity and blah 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 blah, and then you know the West is really focused on creativity and all that sort of stuff. But the two are essential to each other. Mm-hmm. You have to do the rote repetition up front so that your mind is free to be able to create create and innovate and come up with new things. You have to do your 10,000 hours of memorizing chess patterns or practicing your yeah. moves in boxing or jujitsu. Well, then, or, then, yeah. then the answer to my question is that having a good memory does still play a function in our learning. It, yeah, I think it does. And I actually think, just to come back to, to something Hunter was saying, you know, like we have this attitude now that whatever, I can just look that up on Google. Like, I don't mm-hmm. really need to know that. And you find this not just, I mean, you, I think you, you find kids expressing this more and more. And that's what I find kind of dangerous. Mm-hmm. And it's becoming this almost pervasive idea in our culture. I mean, the whole the whole notion of, of, of Google Glass, right? Right. Is, <laughs> like, won't it be freaking incredible when I can walk down the street and, like, I will have the answer to every question just pop up, you know, straight, straight onto my retina, basically. Right. And, like, I won't have to remember anything because, well, the Google Glass is going to tell me the answer. It's kind of like your uh, your phone number. You just go to the name. And, you know, yeah. I don't even but know. It's going to be like that with everything. That's the direction technology is moving in. Mm-hmm. Is you know how do we make this um, the connection between the brains that are the minds that are embodied in our brains and the minds that are embodied in our in our technology? How do we make that connection more and more seamless? Well, um, and I think that that's going to be kind of that that it is not just it's going to be it is a um uh on 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 many levels sort of bad for us as humans well this episode is brought to you by squarespace the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio and for a free trial and 10 percent off go to squarespace.com and use offer code callen8 well, you, you in your on your website, I read the article, and I had read something about him before, the kid who has locked-in syndrome, yeah. where he literally can feel and hear and see uh, and, and I guess even taste everything, but he's he cannot move anything but his eyes up and down, can't even blink. 
I can't yeah. think of anything worse, by the way. But uh, <laughs> I think there's actually the worst thing that can happen to a person. Yeah, I mean, it's the craziest, most unfathomable thing. Not to mention his parents and their pain and everything else. But um, you know that 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 was something. You know, just just having to go through that and having to contend with something like that, and and yet they have a machine now where they're able to put they put electrodes in the back of his head. Has he and and you kind of talk about how he's able to for the first time we're able to kind of chart someone's thoughts. They mm-hmm. actually can think words and 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 you know it's a rudimentary machine at this point, but you know they essentially eventually we're going to be able to tap into our brains and think whatever we want to happen in in the physical world. Well, right? and there was actually you know, an article in TechCrunch yesterday about a device that you don't even have to implant electrodes. You can literally just put it on your head. Wow. Well, so, you know, this is the, the stated vision of Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the founders of Google. Uh, they're on the record saying, like, what we really want Google to be one day is like a chip that's in your brain, and you're going to think of what you want to search for, and the answer is just going to like be channeled straight into your brain. Which sounds like crazy science fiction, mm. but you know, then you read about uh, this guy who I spent time with, who's locked in, and, and, and you know, what they're trying to do with his brain is something that is a, sort of a very primitive, um, like predecessor of, of what Sergey Brin and Larry Page have talked about. Like that's where things are headed, you know, um, and it's crazy. It, ra- it raises it a lot of. But it ra- that's what the future is going to look like. Yeah, but it all. But the one thing I will say is that. Regardless of how much information you have access to, it doesn't necessarily create wisdom. I mean, it does. Yes, you know, you can develop pattern recognition, but and maybe there's even a device for that to make to accelerate that process. But I, I do think that there's something about uh, that sort of you know we're not just machinery. You know, there there's, there there feels like there's some kind of a a higher level of consciousness, uh, something we stay alive for, the wonder and the mystery of things. I know science is taking a lot of that away. But don't you um, think, you know, I don't know, I, I just stay alive. I agree with you totally, yeah. man. Totally. Yeah. yeah, I don't stay alive for that. The, the, I don't think we are. I don't like human beings when they're reduced to their mathematical biology. And I, I know we're a number if you look at us in terms of uh, the genome, but we're more than that, man. We're more than that. You know, explain to me why when I listen to something, a great piece of music, I can feel sad and, and joyous at the same time. I'm not interested in, in you breaking that down into a mathematical equation. I just like living in that wonder and that mystery. And I think all of us do, you know? Yeah. And so how do we create a future where, like, we're not totally um, just married to our technology in my, a way that yeah, my reduces fe- us to that basic kind of, like... Well, I, 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 th- I think we're going to mesh with machines. I think that's inevitable. I think our biology is, you know, we're going to escape from what we would consider our biology. We're going to live in a synthetically, our biology will become more and more synthetic, I suppose, and more more efficient and all those things like Ray Kurzweil always talks about. And But, but I, I do think that my feeling is that humanity and human beings will always have nostalgia for the things that we can't necessarily measure, the things that we can't uh, quantify, and 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 you know that that's kind of probably where religion has always come from. I think that's always been the soil that I think you know even great inspiration, artistic inspiration. Why in the world would you build? Would you would you paint the Sistine Chapel? You know, it's not you're not doing it because it's a rational exercise. You're doing it because you know you just have this overwhelming feeling inside of you. You know. Why would you come see me do stand up in Raleigh, North Carolina, other than to laugh? What what date would I come? Oh, I'm sorry. That'd be the, <laughs> that'd be the 12th, the 13th, and oh, the 14th. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, but you know what I'm saying, Josh? I mean, that's kind of, you know, I don't know. I, man, I hope you're right. Yeah. I hope you're right. I think you're right. Well, what do you worry about? I mean, that's one of the things you worry about. What What is the. Give me, give me some examples of. You know, you've just spent time in the Congo, which I'd love to talk about uh, with these hunter gatherers who, who are still living in that sort of <laughs> dimension. But. We are, we are, this is moving at an exponential rate. You know, the idea that machines are becoming as smart as people and will they have any respect for their biological heritage? What, what is the thing, what are the things that you really worry about? What do you see in the next 5, 10, 15? What are we going to be living like in 20 years, do you think? I mean, the thing that I worry about is that we're the, like, we are constantly in search of technology that solves one set of problems that makes life more efficient, that makes us more productive, that makes life uh, seem easier. And um, like maybe that's not the right mountain for us to be climbing. 
uh, and that's one of the things, you know, I've been spending time living with people uh, who are living as simple a life as there could possibly be in the sense that they don't have any material possessions or very, very, very few material possessions. Um, you know, they don't practice agriculture. They, uh, they wake up in the morning without any food and then they go out and they find food because they hunt and they gather to get food. Amazing. And like on one level, we have made incredible technological progress, incredible material progress in, you know, to compare our way of life to theirs. Mm. But then you look at other aspects of our life and their life and you say, wait a second, like for all of our progress, why is it that we work harder than they do? Like why do they spend more time lounging around, like hanging out with their families, smoking pot, which they do quite a lot of. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> is that right? Oh my God, copious amounts of marijuana. Come on, man. In the Congo? Yeah, this is like they... They have a lot of time on their hands. And that's, that's what they do dude, dude, and, I'm, and these are pygmies. Yeah. And and, yeah. and uh, uh, why have they been so isolated? Because they're just so deep in the forest? They're pretty deep in the forest. And uh, they've got a way of life that has um, they've protected. Um, what, for, for what, what, what are they? So the, and they're primarily carnivores. Uh, they are, I guess you'd call them omnivores. I mean, they, they eat meat and they eat fish and they eat things that they gather out of the forest. So mushrooms, nuts. Uh, fruit, a lot of fruit. How's the food? Food, well, so, I mean, I, I eat everything that they eat. So, wow. Uh, you're shredded. Meat. You've gotten shorter, but you're shredded. Yeah. 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 Uh, monkeys, caterpillars, uh, porcupine, you name it. Wow. How is that, though? Uh, it's actually all pretty good, except for monkey. I find monkey kind of disgusting. <laughs> so, really? I mean, you know, monkeys are really just little people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they are. Uh, what 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 um uh and 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 do they use uh poison arrows and 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 blow guns and things or uh, largely these days they use they use shotguns that they okay. borrow from uh, <laughs> agriculturalist neighbors ah damn damn fire sticks uh, yeah um what do you what is the premise of your of your new book i mean it's well so look these are the largest remaining group of hunter gatherers left on the planet mm -hmm. but until Ten to twelve thousand years ago, everybody was a hunter gatherer. Right. And if you want to understand who we are and how we got to be this way, um, like we evolved, the human species evolved in an environment in which we were hunter gatherers in that context. And these guys are uh, probably the one of the last best windows we have into that way of life. So, uh, and it's disappearing. Like they, you know, these people won't be living like this in fifty years. Is my guess. Sure. Um, I mean, I've read plenty of stuff that always says that hunter-gatherers have lots of time to lounge around, so that, that probably was true even, you know, 10,000 years ago. But presumably part of the reason why they need to spend so little time hunting for their food is that they have shotguns. Like, doesn't that free up a lot of their time? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, this is even from uh, anthropologists who looked at hunter-gatherers before they had shotguns. They were yeah. spending, they've been called the original affluent society because they spend so much of their time engaging in leisure. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's like a real question. What what the hell are we like? What is progress if uh, like we are working sixty hour weeks and like everybody uh, is you know can have be surrounded by incredible material prosperity and yet feel poor? Like these guys don't feel poor. Uh, that's not something I've ever heard them say to me. They that's feel, amazing. That's amazing because I was just thinking as you were saying that I was thinking, what are we doing? Most of what we work for is to garner is to you know, harvest leisure time you know i mean that's you know the idea is oh i'm gonna make a lot of money so i can you know i got my really comfortable couch with my my flat screen and i'm in a neighborhood where it's really quiet and i'm up on a hill with a view and it's all that stuff you know um which you've got to scratch and crawl for you know right yeah so so where's the progress yeah yeah are they uh, are they a healthy people do they are they a long-lived people do they suffer from a lot of different kinds of diseases no, you weren't yeah, you want to talk about like the, the the one advantage that we really have, and we have a lot of advantages. And I, I don't want to pretend like you know this is some romantic, like every, their life is just great. Um, like the biggest advantage we have is that we don't die of stupid illnesses, <laughs> right. and they do die of stupid illnesses. Yeah, yeah, they don't they don't have vaccines, and they get yaws and all kinds of weird skin things and all that. Right? They get all sorts of things, and they die from from stupid infections. That if it were uh, if they were good in New York, they'd go to the doctor and get get uh, antibiotics and be cured in a day and right. you know they die of this stuff 
And you've been you've witnessed these kinds of things. You you've lived yeah. with these tribes and seen this kind of stuff go on. How, yeah. how, what is their relationship to life and death? Is it is it? There's always this notion that when life is and, and death are so precarious. I mean, pick up a history book or just even a a novel at the turn of the century. People were dying of diphtheria and tuberculosis and and all kinds of things before the vaccines came along and and antibiotics and things. Uh, and you always get this sense. You think to yourself, well, losing a child you were already bracing for it so it wasn't quite as bad as it is now you know uh, i i suspect i'm i'm lying to myself yeah i mean people are people and and death is death yeah. and uh it's it's tragic and sad no matter you know who you are or where you live yeah uh, it just happens to be more a part of their life than it is of, of ours what kind of predators uh, are in that forest that they have to worry about poisonous snakes you know snakes are not the biggest concern the biggest concern at least for me, uh, is elephants. Really? Cause, yeah, because you, cause you can sneak up on an elephant by accident and then really piss him off, and he will uh, just charge at you and destroy you. Yeah. And so elephants are a big, big concern. Um, and they live in the deep forest. Yeah. I always yeah. thought of them as savanna animals, but I guess they... they oh, would... no, no, no. There, there, are, there are forest elephants. And when you're walking through the forest, very often you're walking down a trail that was carved by elephants. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow, and, and and what about uh, what about big cats or or yeah, they're leopards, but um, they leave you alone. I, I haven't heard about anybody getting getting eaten by a leopard. No, anytime. no lions, no lions in that area. No, no, not in the forest. No. <laughs> what what about mountain gorillas and chimps? A lot of mountain gorillas, uh, a lot of chimps. Chimps generally don't want to have anything to do with people because we're just generally bad news for them. Yeah. Um, likewise with gorillas, uh, but. You're more likely to encounter. Gorilla. I mean, these guys eat gorilla. They do. Uh, they, oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I've been I've been with them. We we were out hunting for three days, and they hadn't we hadn't shot anything. And gorilla walks right by us, and the guys have to pull the trigger on the gorilla. And I'm like, Dude, you can't do that. Yeah, I'm really sorry. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, please don't um, please don't kill a mountain gorilla. Oh, that sucks. The last one. <laughs> like as you said yeah. that, I was like, please, please say that. Please don't don't uh, hope the gun jams. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 wild, man. Well, I'm looking forward to that book. What's what's the name of that book? I don't know yet. Right, <laughs> it's what a yeah, fascinating no, it's, life. It's still a few man. years away from 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 being. It's not out. Motame, and, is it? And you are gonna you are gonna continue to live down there. Yeah, no, I, I go back every four months or so and stay for a month. I got a ten month old baby, so it's hard it's hard yeah, to yeah. disappear yeah, for yeah, yeah. for large periods of time. Right, and plus being high for that long, it's hard to Skype. <laughs> Oh my God, man! The thing is, what I keep telling them, like, so they they they're very curious now. Like, what? Tell me about your village. You know, like, what are some of the things that happen in your village? Yeah. And I'm like, let me tell you something. There's a state in my village called California, and you can just go into a store, and like, you can choose which kind of marijuana you want, and like, you would take one puff of it, and you would be just out cold because I mean, the, they the, the marijuana that they smoke there is pretty skunky yeah um yeah. and like ah oh, we want to see your village man <laughs> <laughs> yeah have tell him to come on joe rogan oh my god joe rogan's yeah. podcast i smoked weed on his podcast i was high for seven hours i called him i was like dude i gotta drive i got a whole life he goes yeah ha, ha, ha. i was like this is not it's not funny <laughs> you may be able to function i'm a complete idiot uh, by stuff. the way there is the greatest reality show ever take a bunch of congo pygmies and let them loose in los angeles that's i mean a, can you an, imagine that's an amazing how tall are they Josh, uh, they come up to about my shoulder, so maybe at five feet. Strong. There, there are there are guys who are taller than me. I'm pretty short, so yeah. Um, short, but with a big brain, my friend. Short and relatable. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm short and relatable. Yeah, so, um, but they're generally about five feet. I remember reading at some point about how you know the the hunter gatherers, like the women, would like be you know nine months pregnant, walking around drop a baby on the trail and then be walking and going along, you know, without missing a beat. I mean, that's, first of all, it's, <laughs> it's kind of what happened to my wife. Uh, I mean, it, it, she gave birth and was sort of back on her feet within a day and a half. And that's wow. what I've seen. I've seen these guys, uh, the women, sorry, out in the forest give birth and then they are really um, back at it a day, a day later. It's amazing. Uh, Man. It is. It is amazing. But that's amazing on a, on a whole uh, uh, level of just women are amazing, and that's like women, generally speaking, 
Say, let's listen to it. Listen to the liberal Yale guy out here. <laughs> I call him chicks, first of all, Josh. All right, let's get it straight. <laughs> With your politically correct women. And they're amazing in the kitchen I and mean, the bedroom only. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, now you're listening to the Brian Count. So let's bring this a couple levels down. Because this guy, this guy's too smart. Yeah. No, um, no. I let's get back to Moonwalking with Einstein. I really, sure. uh, why, why? It's it's such a it's uh, it really kind of I have to say you know I've been I've done a lot of reading and it's always refreshing when you read a book and you learn something, man. And and you kind of that that whole memory technique is I can't wait to show that off. I'm just going to abuse it. <laughs> uh, please, you got my permission. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, the book is such a fun read as well. I mean, as Brian was saying, like the characters are amazing. I mean, some of those people are far out. I mean, it's it's really impressive what they can do, but their personalities are just so great. Yeah. Well, there. I mean, I, I, the the best thing that I got out of that whole experience was becoming friends with with those guys um, because they are a it's a unique group of people who decide they're going to spend uh, hours a week training them, or hours a day in some cases, training their memories and then competing in these contests. And they're eccentric, interesting, fun, strange people. And uh, I mean, the one thing we haven't talked about is, like, in order to be good at this memory training, mm -hmm. you really have to have a kind of weird imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's actually true. That, that the, the better you are at creating sort of uh, vivid imagery and putting it in a really, you know, these guys have many different palaces, many different geographical locations in which they store their imagery to, to remember things. Yeah, and, and, and the whole art of what you're doing, it's actually not about you training your memory. What you're doing is you're training yourself to come up with really wacky, crazy, funny, strange images as quickly as possible that represent whatever it is that you're actually trying to remember. And sex and is so a good way to... And get really good at that. Yeah. And, and that makes them interesting, strange people. And, and that's also where the title of the book, Moonwalking with Einstein, comes from. That's one of those images that was really important in the, in the, in the card competition, I think it was. Right, yes. Yeah, so that was an image. So, uh, you know, Albert Einstein... Um, like moonwalking, like Michael Jackson with a diamond studded white glove and then, you know, grabbing his crotch and spinning around. That image helped me remember uh, a deck of playing cards in perfect order, which is one of the events in the contest. And I, I just chose it for the title of the book because, like, if you make somebody picture Albert Einstein grabbing his crotch and doing a 360, yeah. that's <laughs> like an unforgettable image. And yeah. hopefully, you know, next time they're in Barnes & Noble, it'll, you know, Cause them to buy many go. copies of the book. By the way, and you should buy many copies of the book because it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating book. But um, and you won this competition, I believe. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, was that sort of, surprising? Sort of giving away the ending, but it's okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, I, mean, I know, I shouldn't do that. But I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't give away the book, though. The book no, is no, no, fascinating, no. so it doesn't matter. I, yeah. You know. So I mean, the upshot was like after I spent a year learning about these techniques and and trying to get good at them at, at using them. And then I came back to this memory contest that I had covered the year before as a journalist, and I entered it, and, and I won, which um, was actually, I mean, I, I was pretty, pretty surprised that that ended up happening. Fellas, are you looking to spice things up in the bedroom? Been fantasizing about surprising your lover with an adventurous new toy or adult movie? Well, here's an offer you will not be able to resist. Go to adamandeve.com, and for a limited time, You'll get 50% off just about any item. But that's not all. Oh, no. Oh, no. When you select your one item at 50% off, you'll also receive three free adult DVDs for a little inspiration, plus a free extra gift so sensual we can't mention it on the radio. <laughs> and to top it all off, we'll even throw in free shipping on your entire order. And no, we're not teasing. So check out adamneve.com today for this special offer. Get 50% off one item when you type Sideshow for the offer code upon checkout. And when you do, you'll get three free DVDs, a free extra gift, and free shipping. Just use offer code Sideshow, S-I-D-E-S-H-O-W at adamneve.com. And how many right. hours had you? Would, did you start? I mean, you must have been. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. But how many hours did you did you practice? Oh, I thought it was interesting. He goes, if you really want to do it, you got to practice an hour a day. And you'd think it'd be like you know eight hours a day, and it's like all dramatic. No, and I'm like, here's the thing. Here's the thing. So Americans um, in this sport of competitive memory 
are like a little bit of a joke on the international stage. Uh-huh. Um, the people who take this really seriously are Germans and Chinese. And Wait a minute, the Germans German. take something really seriously? That's so strange. That's so surprising. <laughs> it's like, I, I swear to God, there's something about this that just like strokes a G-spot in the Teutonic soul. They, <laughs> they're like beside the... The German national mem- national memory champion is like a a celebrity. He's on TV all the time. God, what a um, what a what a strange society. I'm sorry. <laughs> they're so they're, weird. They're truly the strangest society on earth. Oh um, my god. There there anyways, was uh, yeah, anyway. So, Americans we're like um we had at least until recently always been sort of a joke on the international memory stage. Yeah. But now the, we we're just really well represented. Uh hope Hopefully my book has contributed to this. I don't. I don't know. But I'm sure we, it has. I mean, there are a lot of books that are written on memory, but this, this, from what I've read and reviews and things, this is the book. This is the book to read. So, well, so the people who compete in the contest now take it much more seriously than they did when I competed, and I would never be able to win today. Um, the guy who won the championship the last couple of years is like, I mean, he he, he competes for he trains for hours a day. And what did he do? Um, Give us an example of what he had to do to win. Um, let's see, what's, what's he well known for? So, I mean, he can memorize a deck of playing cards in perfect order in well under a minute. Um, so ridiculous. And what's the world record for the so the 52, uh, for and the playing now, card? I think it's about 20 seconds, which you can't flip over a pack of cards in 20 seconds. Uh, so these guys are nuts. just breathing through them. Um, and, it's, and it's, of course, it's the Germans who are, who are really excellent at this, the Germans and the Chinese. But you you also talked about there's something called neuroplasticity. So when you look at uh, uh, cab drivers who study the knowledge, which is learning the, I think it's 2,500, you know, um, or maybe even 25,000 different streets and landmarks and everything else in London. It's a very confusing city if anybody's ever been there. And and like three out of ten people actually pass the test. It takes two to three to four years to actually learn the knowledge. Then they take this test. Um, and their brains actually, uh, the navigational section of their brains has actually grown. It's bigger than the average brain. However, memory champions, their brains uh, th- th- are not different looking uh, no. with an MRI scan. No. So there's, I mean, some scientists went looking. They thought, oh, well, these guys, you know, they've trained their memory to do this. They must have brains that are just different. Um, and they found that that's not the case. Mm-hmm. What is different in the brains of the memory champions is if you put them in an fMRI scanner and look at what parts of the brain are active when they're learning new information, when they're memorizing new information, you can see they're using their brains differently. Mm-hmm. And the, the way in which they're using their brains differently is they are activating parts of the brain associated with uh, spatial navigation and visual imagery, mm-hmm. which, like, it's just that you don't need the, the brain scan to tell you that, right? Like, you just ask the guys, what are you doing? What's the technique that you're using? It's, oh, we're using visual imagery, and we're walking around in these memory palaces, creating images of the things that we want to remember. So, of course, when you look at their brains, you know, you, you see them activating parts, regions that are associated with, with, with those two kinds of cognition. So, the thing is, anybody can learn those techniques, and they're not very complicated, and if you take anybody, teach them these techniques, and put them in an fMRI scanner, you will see that they are using their brains differently. And, um, yeah, amazing. yeah, and it's not just that they're using their brains differently. It's that you know, I thought what you were talking about with you know the only person who's ever been demonstrated in a study to have photographic memory that that's a pretty questionable study. I mean, could you tell us a little bit about photographic memory? We hear so much about that. You know, some people insist they have it. Some, I used to say I had it because I can memorize lines really quickly. Yeah. But I think it's, I'm just out of my own way, and I can just—I don't know—I'm not—I don't even know if I'm associating. I'm just probably have a really big brain. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, well, but you know, you know, they say about people with big brains. Right? Exactly, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, big feet. Big feet. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, photographic mem- basically anybody who tells you they have photographic memory is full of it. Um, mm. and it, it. If by photographic memory they mean that they are able to take a snapshot with their mind's eye and then like perfectly reconstruct what they took a snapshot of, that, that just does not exist. Nobody can Xerox with their mind's eye. Mm. And in the 70s, scientists went out looking for people who claimed to have this ability, and they found one woman who actually really did seem to have an incredible photographic memory. And they tested her, and she could like um, remember patterns of random dots a, a day later after having seen them. Um, but 
she ended up marrying the scientist who studied her. She was never studied again by anybody else. <laughs> and now pretty much everybody thinks that this very famous scientific paper, which was published in the journal Nature, like one of the most famous uh, scientific journals in the world, most people now think that that was basically bullshit. And <laughs> yeah. uh, the fact that nobody has ever been found with a photographic memory since then seems to be pretty strong evidence that this it's is tr- not strong, strong evidence that she was very good in bed. <laughs> exactly. right. you know, yeah, there you go. Even a scientist can compromise his, <laughs> his integrity. His integrity for a good piece of tail, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that's wild, man. Josh, you guys are all so young. How old are you? Uh, 30. Yeah, you're 30. 30, already doing this kind of stuff. I'm a failure. Um, How old are you? I'm 46, but I have very tight fitting skin. <laughs> so, in person, I look, I look with a, from a distance, I look almost 30. Um, You'll have to come out to my stand-up sometime and, and uh, judge me. And just, you know, I'm going to be there in Rally on the, uh, what oh, is it, 13th, that, 14th, and 15th. That's what I'm talking about, brother. It's actually the 12th, 13th, and 14th. 14th but... well, so, so don't mind me. I'm not a memory champion. <laughs> <laughs> He's retired. He's hung up his cleats. He's retired, and that's how it is. Um, one other thing that I wanted to ask you about, Josh, is there's, uh, you know, on your website, you talk about uh, the Suka City and then... Uh, uh, Atlas Obscura, you know, you founded these two things, and they both seem to have um, about be about interesting spaces and you know um, architecture and all that sort of stuff. And just in terms of you know visual spatial memory, you know that that memory palace, the really looking at spaces. I was wondering why why did you get interested in those things? Is that you know where is that leading to? Oh well, um, hmm. I can tell you. So Atlas Obscura, yeah, is uh, a guide to the world's wondrous and curious places uh it's like uh if you want to if you're going to say you know raleigh north carolina and you want to know where's all the really weird shit in raleigh north carolina this is where you would find it um mm. and uh cool because, atlas yeah, part, atlas obscura yep atlas obscura huh. um and now now i'm actually now having said that i want to make sure that we actually have some good stuff near raleigh north carolina <laughs> Um, <laughs> has, but, as he, uh, frantically, yeah, yeah, as he I, I, frantically goes to it, yeah. Oh my God! Oh, you have to go to this when you're in, when you're in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. Right, so in, in Durham, I've got this on my computer screen. There's this bridge that is 11 feet eight inches tall. It's like a railway bridge, right? And I guess all trucks are like 12 feet tall, and trucks just never see the sign that says this bridge is 11 feet eight, eight inches tall. So there are videos on the internet of just like truck after truck after truck just going through and getting decapitated <laughs> by wow. this bridge. Wow. Um, wow. So you should just go park yourself out there during the day Done. between your shows and just watch trucks get, get, the, get, tops get the tops kind of peeled off. <laughs> yeah. I told yeah. you, you should have gone to and and just go and just with a sign. Should have gone to Atlas, Atlas Obscura. Obscura. That that's exactly. your that's your commercial for the website. There it is. That's funny. All right, I'll do that. I'll do that. Um, well, I look forward to your next book, my friend, and uh, uh, and thank you for for doing the Brian, the esteemed Brian Callum show. <laughs> it, it was truly an honor. Thanks for having me on. You, you you will sell millions of books, and we're going to put the book on the website, and uh, so check it out. And uh, that's Josh Forer, who's comes from. Uh, uh, your whole fa- what the, here's my last question. I mean, how the hell did your parents instill in you guys not only sort of such interest in the world but such creativity? I mean, you're all such independent thinkers. It seems how how in the world, I mean, did that happen? <laughs> I mean, I know that's a really unfair and ridiculous question. Yeah, it is. A, it's I mean, hard. Um, but, I don't know. Know. my folks are pretty 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 good people. They're, what what uh, do your folks do? They both they both do public interest sort of nonprofit kind of kind of work. Amazing, man. Amazing. Well, whatever it is, man, I, I, those genes are good. Uh, thank you, my friend. Appreciate thank you. it. And uh, we'll, we'll, when you're finished with your um, book on the Congo, come back to us. I'd love to do that. All right, buddy. I'll talk to you later. All right. Take care. Later. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Bye. That's Josh Forer, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, moonwalking with Einstein. Um, that's the science of remembering. Um, and that, 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 was, that was great, man. Talk about learning something. That was awesome. Um, I don't know. I'm looking through my phone right now. I think we're done. That's uh, great. Yeah. And but where will you uh, be on the 12th, 13th, and 14th, Brian? Oh, that's. I'm glad you asked. Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm actually looking. My wife's sending me pictures of. Um, this is literally a question I got about a house. It and she's like a middle class girl from Denver. Is 3.3 million dollars completely out of our range? <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me. 
just just on the podcast, let me just say it's way the fuck out of our range. Unless, yeah. unless if you guys go and buy like you know ten or twelve million copies of Moonwalking with Einstein right now, we through get the Amazon the, through, through Amazon, Amazon on the website. website. Yeah, yes. then then, then uh, I might be able to afford it. So whatever yeah. you do, go buy a shitload of books, everybody. And also, you'll be helping out uh, the pygmies of the Congo That's because right. Josh will take them to this place called California and allow them to experience. There you go. Yeah. Well, guys, I really hope you learned everything on this podcast. <laughs> uh, Hunter Motz, thank you. Mike Casentini, our producer, thank you. Rena, yeah. another, uh, what would you consider yourself? Our engineer? What a great voice she has. <laughs> right, say that one more time. Just, just say, I'm your engineer. Oh, man, I'm loving it. All right, that's our time, ladies and gentlemen. We've had it with you. Later. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show. Be sure to visit briancallen.com for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash Comedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.